So hello everyone. Um, today's interview is with John Delalio, who I'm fortunate enough and lucky enough to be able to call my colleague. Um, he is currently at Duquesne University and we will be dialoguing or discussing um, the topic of Lacanian neuropsychoanalysis. And um, John has a series of papers and I'll make sure to, to make sure that those are listed underneath this um, in the chat of this video. But the one we'll be focusing on today is a publication in the journal Neuropsychoanalysis and it's entitled Of Brains and Borromean Knots, the Lacanian Meta Neuropsychology. So John, thanks very much for joining us for this um, interview and discussion. And um, I'm gonna start off with a question which you'll be able to anticipate um, and I think many Lacanian uh, uh, people would be able to anticipate. And, um, and that's simply to say that that's so many Lacanians seem to have an almost immediate uh, allergic reaction to the attempt or the appeal to the biological, presumably the neurological. Um, and I think you, you, you mentioned this right earlier on in the paper where you say that maybe it's the case that for many people, the very notion of a Lacanian neuropsychoanalysis sounds a little bit like a type of oxymoron. So I just wanted to give you that first opening question as a, as, as a way to, to let me know where you stand. I mean, obviously, <laughs> you've done important work in the area. But what would you say by way of response to someone who might say, oh, Lacan doesn't want any neuropsychoanalysis? Yeah, and thank you so much for having me, Derek. Um, it's really a, a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, it's it's a really a, a, a recurrent question. You know, there was um, the I think it was the last in-person neuropsychoanalysis congress before you know the pandemic and everything, which was in Brussels, and it was I think the first congress to really have an explicit call for any type of Lacanian thinking in neuroscience. And one week before that was I believe the World Association of Psychoanalysis, the Lacanian Congress also in Brussels titled The Unconscious and the Brain, Nothing in Common. I don't know if that was a coincidence or not, but um, so yeah, it's definitely something that you know, always comes up um, on this question. And it's not, it's not invalid. You know, I think that I, I like to distinguish between neuroscience and the, pra the practice and study of neuroscience from so-called neuroscientific discourse and how the brain is usually talked about and even how this weaves its way into some of the interpretation and discussion of neuroscientific findings. Um, but there's, there's, you know, this fear of bioreductionism that, you know, all of these psychic processes and uh, concepts can be reduced to a neural explanation and therefore we don't need the psychic anymore. We can just have neural, neural explanation and, you know, boom, we've got it. Um, and that it's, it is something very real and to be worried about. You know, there is, there is an excellent study um, that was done, I think McCabe and Castell, I may be misremembering that, but it was um, the same sort of um, scientific paper that was given, shown to participants. And for the graph on the paper, some of them had sort of bar graphs and others had images of brains. Nothing else was different. It was just the difference whether they saw an image of a brain or a bar graph. And people rated the paper with the brains as more scientific than the paper without the brain. So yeah, just this is just to give you know the, the criticism. It's a very it's a valid criticism. Um, but I think that when and it's it's an interesting paradox when you look at the neuroscience very closely and sort of push it to its limit and the radicality of some of the findings, neuroscience itself is is non-reductive. It's sort of it it fails to reduce everything to itself. You know, one um, great example would be all the work on neuroplasticity and epigenetics. That um, the the basic idea that the brain is open to experience. That as the you know the infant is born and even prior to birth during the gestation in the womb, um, life experiences literally change the structure of the brain. That it changes synaptic connectivity, the strength of synaptic associations, and things like that. Um, changes the way different memories are processed and the um, sort of even long-term um, patterns. For example, um, early effects of trauma um, are, clear, are found to have clear impact on hippocampal. So the hippocampus is a structure um, which is associated with declarative memory, sort of episodic memory. You know, I remember this morning I made coffee and blah, blah, blah. That's like an episodic memory um, versus you know, in cases of trauma, it's known that there's sort of a fragmenting and a fracturing of memory. And it's not to say that you can replace that with neuroscientific explanation, but the fact that neuroscience finds that these external non-neural events 
change and impact the very functioning of the neural shows that the neural can't be reduced to just the neural. You can't explain the brain without recourse to something beyond the brain. Um, so I think that's one interesting um, sort of notion that you, you can't think of the brain as a whole entity unto itself. The, the brain is, you know, it, 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 it has inputs from within the body, it has inputs from beyond and in, in not, not in a one-to-one -one fashion. Um, and one, one other point that, that is, I think, important to make, you know, the, the idea that, you know, Lacan would categorically reject any type of dialogue with neurosciences is that Lacan himself engages with neuroscience. Um, if you read them, uh, the early seminars of one and two, um, he often references the cortex as a mirror when he's talking about the mirror stage, and he thinks about it as sort of a, a cortical mirror. Um, when he speaks about the um, Freud's notion of um, prematuration of helplessness from the 1895 project, um, you know, a, a key concept for psychoanalysis and for Lacan uh, and you know, the, the original discord of the infant, which causes it to need to turn to you know, the um, denaturalizing social world. Um, it, Lacan speaks about the prematuration of the pyramidal neurons and the prematuration of brain development at birth. Um, and another example, which I think is incredible, is um, in seminar three, when Lacan is talking and in introducing metaphor and metonymy, you know, very key concepts for the symbolic, the key references he uses are sensory and motor aphasias. These are neurological disorders. Um, so it's, it's not that there's this replacement of the mind with the brain, but clearly, even for Lacan, there is some relationship between psychoanalysis and neurology and the neurosciences. That's a, it's a pretty convincing argument. Um, I, I got to say, I find myself more convinced now. Um, but maybe one way to develop on some of what you have so helpfully outlined for us is, is to ask a kind of naive question. And, and that naive question is that many people coming to neuropsychoanalysis for the first time um, are probably thinking about that the key agenda here is to localize for example, Freudian concepts in certain functional areas of the brain. And um, I don't know the area very well, but I do remember going to um, a Mark Soames lecture where you know, he kind of did, he did this thing. And um, I mean, just incidentally, it, it, it had such a, a, you know, the audience was like in, kind of enthralled by this. It, it, was a, it was a sense of like, oh, this is a way of showing how, how Freud had got something right, and now we've got some you know, verification and empirical data to show this. But anyways, um, my, my somewhat lame anecdote aside, what do you have to say about this, this idea that the kind of first step in a type of neuropsychoanalysis should be to localize certain uh, Freudian concepts in functional areas of the brain? What is your critique of that? How do you develop that? Um, and what is your, your general position? Um, in terms of that? Yeah, so I think it's, it's, you know, definitely something that happens. And I think to a certain degree, it's a necessary first step um, uh, for a project like neuropsychoanalysis. You know, the, um, the, the basic philosophical foundation for the field, at least as Mark Solms, who essentially founded the field, introduced, um, is uh, the, the position of dual aspect monism. It's, it's a philosophical position on the so-called you know, mind the perennial mind-body problem. Of, um, it, the idea is that there is something out there in the world, um, uh, in a certain, even in a Kantian sense, like a, a thing in itself. And there are two ways of, of observing this thing for us humans. There is the objective way of looking at this thing. You can look at it as the brain, you can poke it, you can measure it, you can you know, scan it, you can cut it up and look at the little pieces. And there's also the subjective way of viewing the brain where you turn your attention inward. And this is the, these are the two um, uh, pr perspectives that neuropsychoanalysis looks at. Neuroscience, looking at the brain as an object and psychoanalysis looking at the brain as a subject. And the idea is that whatever this thing is in the world, it is both an object and a subject so that if you are able to think about it and map it, and when you look at the brain, you see that it has these different types of areas that they do different types of functions. Um, and when you look at the mind from a psychoanalytic perspective, you would also, I mean, Freud discerns different dimensions of the mind. You know, it, ego, super ego is the, um, the, probably the most famous example. So that there is some degree of, I, I think there has to be some degree of capacity for at least a broad correspondence. And this is, a, it lets me 
uh, speak about another important concept for neuropsychoanalysis, um, the, this idea of dynamic localization. So I think that when I say that it's a necessary step, this localizing process, I think that at a broad level, it's necessary to even begin thinking mind and brain because you need some way to speak sort of in, in a certain sense to speak to the other side. Um, and this notion of dynamic localization is essentially that you don't have a one-to-one -one correspondence say, you know, I take this psychic concept, you know, ego and look, it's in that part of the brain and just that part of the brain. Um, uh, the idea is that um, psychic concepts, psychic processes uh, ex don't exist in a single neural structure. They exist in a dynamic constellation of activity between neural structures. Um, so that in the, the, the logic for this really comes from the lesion method in, within clinical neuropsychology more broadly, where you can have um, focal injury to one part of the brain and the patient will display relatively focal deficits. For example, um, I mentioned the hippocampus before as this, process, as this um, structure underwriting um, the episodic memory. You can have patients who have focal lesions to the hippocampus, either for um, injury or some type of um, degenerative process or infectious process. And you know, these patients are unable to recall an event that happened a few seconds ago. Um, uh, and so it, it, it is, uh, in a certain sense, uh, uh, the, there is a capacity for localization. And just as a side note, I think this is an excellent um, opportunity for psychoanalytic research to be able to do psychoanalytic psychotherapy and clinical research with certain patient populations that, so um, there, there's an excellent study um, by uh, Paul Moore um, of a long-term uh, psychoanalytic treatment with a patient with profound amnesia. The patient cannot remember the explicit contents from session to session. Nevertheless, something like a transference develops, something like relational changes emerge without any reflective awareness of it. And in a sense, isn't this even Lacanian in the sense that, you know, it's the symbolic um, uh, the, uh, dimension that's operative here, not your ability to give your yourself the imaginary, you know, oh, yes, I understand that so-and-so happened 10 sessions ago, and I'm explicitly linking it to this. No. So I think that just as an aside, it's a great research opportunity. Um, but back to your question on, on the localization, I think that from my perspective, uh, a degree of broad localization in that sense is, necess is necessary to begin talking to the other side. Um, but one thing that in my work in Lacanian neuropsychoanalysis has brought me to think more recently, I don't really uh, mention this in the paper um, that you mentioned, but it's some of the more recent stuff, is that look, thinking of localization not only at the level of so-called positive things, so I'm localizing this thing called the ego or this thing called the id to these various neural structures, which Mark does, um, and I can explain that later if that would be helpful, um, but also to think of localization at the level of so-called negativity, or um, this is my attempt to think of the Lacanian real into this, that it's not just that you can correlate different structures to different psychic processes together. I think it's also fruitful to think of how disjuncture or um, you know, short circuiting or failure on the side of neuroscience and certain imminent failures of neural circuits, of neural processes, computational processes, can be fruitfully thinked in relation to sort of imminent failures on the psychoanalytic side, which is really um, uh, Lacan's contribution with the real here as you know the symbolic um, being uh, sort of non-totalizing itself, that the real is this imminent torsion of the symbolic, um, that to be able to think how one real in the psychoanalytic sense is related to the real in a neurological sense. It's kind of paradoxical to think that the bridge might be most fruitful at the point of the real, the so-called you know, non-relation, um, I think is actually maybe a sort of paradoxical way of thinking the relationship between the two disciplines. 